Thank you very much for being here. Uh, my name is Guillaume Molter. I'm a senior web and application developer for the School of Public Health at Harvard. Sorry. Oh. And um, is that better? Okay, cool. Uh, and we're going to talk about hosting WordPress with uh, Amazon Web Services. Uh, before I get started, a couple of disclaimers. Uh, the first one is I'm not affiliated with Amazon, didn't receive any money to give that talk. Um, Amazon Web Services, as I was preparing this presentation, was offering a little bit over 98 services. I am not going to cover all of them. I'm going to keep kind of keep uh, to the ones we're using at the School of Public Health. It's also going to be a pretty fast-paced talk, so I'm really sorry, but there's a lot to talk about in very little time. Uh, you should not necessarily use AWS for your net project. Uh, what I mean by that is there's plenty of other hosting company and cloud hosting platforms out there uh, managing a WordPress installation on AWS uh, requires skills and a lot of resource and time. So if you don't have the resource and time to do it, please use someone, you know, outsource this to a, a hosting company, a competent one and that it, they're going to do a great job. But sometimes, in like our case, you're gonna have, you will not have the choice and you will need to use AWS. So today's talk is about, you know, what you should do if you have to use AWS for your project. And finally, I'm a human, I made mistakes, I say some stupid things sometimes, feel free to chime in at the end if you wanna, you know, correct anything I would say that might be wrong or if you have a better ID. Um, all right, what we do at Harvard. Uh, so we manage a whole bunch of different websites. We have multiple uh, WordPress multi-sites installation. The main one is definitely the school's website. Uh, it's a WordPress multi-site with a little bit over, over a thousand Android websites hosted on one single WordPress installation. Uh, we have a little bit over 100 plugins and 15 themes hosted on that multi-site environment. Uh, we receive around, on an average month, a million visitors, uh, 170 million hits per month. However, the specificity of that traffic is that it really comes into spikes. Uh, the school is really big on live events, uh, you know, conferences, and you have all the academic events, etc. cetera. Uh, so we will have a very low to average traffic on a daily basis. However, suddenly we'll see a lot of people you know coming to the website because something is happening and because of that we need to, uh, to have an, a hosting environment that is able you know to evolve with the uh, with the traffic um, and finally harvard big name we're obviously also a prime target for hackers so security is a big concern of us of ours um, a little bit about how we came to AWS and, and how this happened. Uh, this website used to be hosted fully in-house on our own servers. Uh, that was, you know, a lot uh, needed a lot of human resource to manage those servers. It was costly for the school. So they eventually decided to move the hosting to a third-party hosting company. So first we started with a, you know, hosting company and things didn't go very well. We had per poor performance, uh, very you know, low to bad uh, availability, and their notion of scaling was basically you connect to the dashboard of our hosting and you spin up new servers, uh, which was definitely not you know, a suitable solution because you can't at three in the morning if suddenly someone tweeted something about and you can't ask your admin to go and spin up new servers manually. That, that was not a suitable solution for us. And eventually in 2013, Harvard signed a big contract with AWS to move all their hosting solution and server needed into the cloud to AWS. So one morning our boss came to my predecessor and told him, you know, we need to move, every, we're stopping the contract with the hosting company and we need to move everything to AWS because this is where Harvard is heading. Uh, and uh, so we moved everything to AWS and then 
And then when I started two years ago, we were still, we were using solely AWS, but we were still doing most of these things manually, et cetera. And I took over the hosting part and tried to automate as many things as possible using AWS. <coughs> so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about what we did and how we're managing that WordPress multi-site installation. So this is our current production environment. If you don't understand anything about that graph, that's okay because that's why we're here today and we're gonna talk about you know, what everything in here actually means and stands for. So before we start, a few key concepts. Uh, scalability and elasticity. Um, those two terms are all over the place when you start to talk about cloud hosting. Um, they have multiple definitions that you can find out on the web, uh, but, and they actually have a lot of overlap. Basically, scalability means the ability of your hosting infrastructure to grow over time with, you know, with your business needs. Chances are when you launch your, your school WordPress multi-site, you're gonna have you know, 10, maybe 50 websites, but over time, your university grow, you have new student clubs, more and more people want website, so you have a growing environment and you need to have a hosting environment that is able to grow over time with your, the needs of your business. So that's scalability. And elasticity is what I was referring earlier, is the ability of your hosting environment to grow really quickly to accommodate a, a large amount of traffic, but then also reduce in size when you don't have this traffic anymore. Region and availability zones. Uh, another thing about cloud hosting is your server is not physically located in your school anymore. It's located you know, in data centers or potentially all over the globe. For this, AWS used two terms, regions, which are like actual real, uh, geographical regions, and then inside of those regions, they have divided those regions into multiple availability zones, which basically stands for different data centers, which means if you have two servers that are located in two availability zones, you're basically going to create, you know, if one data center goes down, the other one will still be available, etc. So you create some kind of redundancy. Uh, talking about redundancy, two other very important thing when you talk about cloud hosting is resiliency and redundancy. We're going to try to remove as much as possible that one single point of failure. We're going to try to b build something that cannot break. There's always a way to break it, obviously, but we're going to try to remove as many of those points as possible. Okay, so let's now talk more concretely about hosting WordPress on AWS. So obviously, the very first thing you're going to want is a web server. And for this, you're gonna use a service called EC2. EC2 stands for Elastic Cloud Computing. And so the EC2 instances, which are your little web servers, they come in different type and different sizes. Uh, the type refers, so the M is the standard one, the T is a burstable instance, which means you're going to have some credit for CPU. When you don't use that credit, you create a cache of credit, and whenever you need a little bit more, uh, CPU, you're gonna have more CPU available to you for free. Uh, the C is CPU optimized instances and X is memory optimized. So depending on your needs, you may wanna choose one or the other. I would suggest starting with M since it's like the standard one. Uh, and in terms of size, uh, nano, micro, small, etc., that basically ex refers to the amount of CPU and memory you're going to have available on that instance. So, okay, we have our server, and now how do I put my LAMP stack? And I put LAMP here uh, because it's still, I think, the most common uh, hosting environment for WordPress, but you could put Nginx or anything you want. So how do we put that, how do we put the actual software for the web server? Um, we're gonna use two things here. Uh, we're gonna use an AMI. An AMI is an image of the hard drive. So uh, there's different types of AMIs. Uh, you have a blank Linux AMI, so just it's simply going to put Ubuntu on your EC2 instance. You have some free community AMIs with an entire web server, so you're gonna get your entire LAMP server on the image, so you put the image on your server and boom, you have a functional web server. And then you have also commercial ones, where you're gonna pay a little bit more per hour for your instance, and it will come with a fully supported hosting environment provided by another company. 
Um, in our case, we use the first option. We use the blank Linux AMI, and we're going to use something called user data, uh, which also is called cloud init by most other cloud providers and um, in the Linux world. And cloud init basically allows you to run a script whenever your instance starts and install the software you want to install on it. So we use a blank Linux AMI, and whenever the instance starts, we run that script and we install Apache, PHP, and all the other libraries that we need on the instance. OK, great. Now we have our functional web server. So how do we put WordPress on and our code, our plugins, etc., on our instance? For this, again, AWS offers a, a whole bunch of different plug uh, services. Um, code Comment is going to allow you to host some private Git repositories. Code Build is going to allow you to run tests and build, and build your app. Uh, code Pipeline kind of goes on top of this and helps you move your actual code from one service to another. And the most important one in our case is going to be Code Deploy. And Code Deploy is going to be a service to which you're going to give your, app, your code and is going to take care of taking your code and putting it on the actual web server. And you're going to understand why it's important in a second. Because as I mentioned in the beginning, Redundancy, redundancy, redundancy. We want to get rid of the single point of failure. And if we have one single web server that does everything, then if that web server you know, goes down, your entire website goes down. This is a big problem. So we're going to try to avoid this. And how do we do that? We're going to use two other services. The first one is called Elastic Load Balancer, which is going to stand in front of your servers and it's going to distribute the traffic between different servers. And the other one we're going to use is called Elast uh, Auto Scaling Group. Sorry. And Auto Scaling Group is going to, based on rules that you define, bring in new instances into your hosting environment. And your Elastic Load Balancer will distribute the traffic along those different uh, web servers. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about how do we decide to bring a new instance in a couple slides? So you're going to tell me, OK, uh, but how, how do I manage my database? If I have multiple web servers, where does my database go? It's, I can't put my database on multiple web servers. So it's true. We're going to use a different service for that. We're going to use a service called RDS. And RDS is basically an EC2 instance that is fully managed and optimized for database hosting. It's, it's a service provided by AWS. Just like EC2 comes in different type and sizes, and I think I forgot to mention for the EC2 instance, obviously the price that you pay per hour for those instances is going to vary depending on the size and the type of instance that you choose. So we're going to move our database to that, to RDS. But again, we don't want a single point of failure. So we don't want to have our database only on one single RDS instance. So to get rid of that, we're going to use a, a native system from both MySQL and RDS, a, a master and read replica system. So we're going to have one database that will handle the read and writes, and then we're going to have multiple other smaller databases that are like clones of the main one that are handling all the reads. So whenever you know someone is visiting your website, instead of sending the request to the main database, we're going to send those requests to our read replicas. And to do that, we're going to use a WordPress plugin called HyperDB. And HyperDB will handle the fact, will tell WordPress how to work with those multiple databases for you without you needing to worry too much about it. So again, same problem. When I upload files, where are they going? If I have multiple web servers, my files, my up WP upload folder is going to be split on multiple servers. So that's, you know, that's not going to work. So again, we're going to move the upload folder out of the web server. To do that, we're going to use another service called S3. S3, uh, simple storage something service, <laughs> um, is a high re uh, resiliency, super optimized file storage system offered by AWS. Uh, it's used by a lot of companies, Dropbox, Netflix, etc., to store their files. Um, and we're, again, going to use two WordPress plugins 
uh, one depending on the other, uh, WP off Offload S3 uh, is going to automate the process of whenever someone uploads a file to WordPress to the media library, where, uh, the plugin is going to take that file, upload it to S3, and replace inside of your database the link to that file to say that file has been uploaded to S3 and it's located there. Um, and then WP Offload S3 requires another plugin called Amazon Web Services that brings you know, the just basic information on how to communicate with AWS. And finally, we also use another service called Glacier, and Glacier is a cold storage solution, and we're gonna use this to do a backup of your S3 files, because as much as we like to think that S3 can't fail, and I, to this date, I haven't heard of people actually losing files in S3. Uh, we've seen some major S3 outage. Uh, you usually know because half of the internet is down. Uh, but we've seen some outages, but never actually people losing files. But still, it's always good to have backups. You need to have backups. So we're going to use Glacier to do backups of those S3 files. OK, so now we have a fully functional and kind of scalable environment for WordPress in AWS. But let's spin, uh, speed things up, you know, let's make it a little bit faster. Uh, so the first thing we're gonna do is implement a CDN. So in front of S3, we're gonna put CloudFront. CloudFront is basically act as a cache. They have multiple location around the globe. And whenever someone requ requests a file from, you know, your S3, so whenever someone requ requests a, an image, a CSS file, JS file, etc. The first time AWS is going to grab it from S3, but then it's going to store it into the, the cache at CloudFront. And it's going to be served much faster to, for the next users who are asking those files. The second thing we're going to do is implement caching. Uh, to do this, we're going to use another service called Elastic Cache. And again, Elastic is just another EC2 instance that is managed and optimized for caching, and it's fully managed by AWS. Again, comes in different type and size, price varies depending on the type and size, and while we use mem Memcache, they also offer Redis nodes. So if you prefer Redis over Memcache, you're also free to do that. And Memcache is going to, again, uh, serve as a middle you know, caching system between your web server and the database. It's going to prevent the web server to do requests to the database over and over again when the, you know, when we could, some of them can just be cached. So to do that, we're gonna use two plugins, Memcache Redux, which is going to implement object caching. So that's what I was talking about, that saving those requests that have already, that are like recurring. But we also use another plugin called that cache, and that cache will actually store entire HTML pages into a cache and serve them to the user directly instead of regenerating. One of the most costly, uh, you know, WordPress is pretty, by default, WordPress is pretty bad in terms of performance. Whenever you request a page, it's doing a lot of things by default and generating that page is costly. So if we can, whenever a page is asked by multiple users in a very short amount of time, if we can just cache it and just serve it straight, that saves a lot of time. And therefore, because we're paying for resources, you know, per the hour, et cetera, if you save time, you also save money. So why not? All right, security. As I was mentioning, this is something very important for us. It should be very important for everyone, obviously. Uh, a few basics. You may have seen the term VPC appearing on some of the slides. VPC stands for Virtual Private Cloud. This is uh, a box that you're going to be able to put around your environment. You're going to, whenever you create a resource, you're gonna say, I wanna put it in that box or this box. And what it's going to do, it's going to prevent services, services to talk to each other if they're in different boxes. So if you're hosting multiple websites, you put them in, in separate VPCs. This way, if a hacker get access to one, they won't be able to breach the other service because they will be locked inside of this VPC. Uh, and also, usually it's good practice if you work in a three-tier or four-tier environment, meaning if you have a dev, 
staging, production, maybe a QA environment on top of that, it's also good practice to usually put them also in separate VPCs. So if something goes wrong, if again a hacker get access to one, they can't bridge the other one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, another important thing: security groups. By default, whenever you create a resource in AWS, it won't be able to do anything, and you're going to be you're going to need to create one by one security groups to tell, okay, this database, I want to allow it to talk to this specific web server. I want to allow people to SSH into that, that instance. I want this IP range, so for example, the school's IP range to be able to, lo to log into that server, but other people should not be able, et cetera, et cetera. That all is going to be done by security groups. And again, by default, you can't do anything, so it gives you a really very secure and granular way to grant access to your resources. Encryption and certificates, uh, obviously very big, big topic recently. Um, AWS is very good at encouraging you to, and allowing you to encrypt basically everything. You can en encrypt yeah, everything, in including inside of your infrastructure. One big mistake is usually to encrypt everything outside, but then once you're inside of the VPC, you know, everything is open and you can do whatever you want. Uh, AWS allow you to even in encrypt the, uh, the communication inside. So whenever your web server talks to your database, etc., that should also be encrypted. And AWS is really good at letting you do this. So you should absolutely use it if you can. Uh, and finally, I am, uh, it's their identity management solution. Well, again, you create users that get access, who can create resource, who can manage what, who can access those S3 files, uh, can they access them but not delete them, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of granularity here again, which is pretty great. Okay, um, so as I was mentioning, uh, Harvard, big name, uh, we have a lot of DDoS problems. Uh, especially School of Public Health, we publish a lot of articles, studies, etc., on topics that people don't really want to hear about, you know, gun violence and the problem with sodas and all those topics that, yeah, people don't want to hear about. So we have a lot of DDoS problems. We're, we're at some point on pretty much constant DDoS attack for a couple weeks. Uh, so we very, very soon, uh, back in, I think, 2011 or something like that, implemented the web application firewall. Um, this is basically going to make sure that the traffic that reach out to your servers is genuine traffic and not a malicious one. And it's also going to be able to prevent at the source whenever you're under DDoS attack, trying to mitigate that as early as possible without taking down your web servers. Uh, for this, uh, we don't use the Amazon service, but they have a WAF solution, Web Application Firewall. And yeah, uh, again, we don't use it because we were already using another provider when they launched their service, but they have a solution for that too. Okay, so now we have a scalable, you know, pretty much optimized hosting environment, it's secure. How do we keep track of all of this? How do we make sure that our hosting environment stays healthy? Um, once again, AWS has a whole bunch of services to do that, and you can get all the data in the world. But here, uh, the one that really going to interest us is called CloudWatch. And CloudWatch is basically going to pull some metrics from all those services we've been talking about and putting them inside of one dashboard. So we're gonna get data from our EC2 instance, auto scaling groups, auto elastic load balancer, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, You're gonna be able to define some metrics and create alarms based on, on those metrics. So whenever the CPU of your EC2 instance is either too high or too low, I wanna receive an alarm, et cetera. Uh, it's also going to allow you to store logs. So obviously, if we have multiple web servers, we're going to have an issue because our logs are going to be separated in different servers. So whenever we have a problem and we want to understand what's going on, it's a pain because we need to connect to every single server to download the Apache log or the PHP error log to see what's going on. And it is. Uh, 
it's, go it's going to get rid of that problem by actually fetching the logs and storing them inside of the service too. Uh, so back to our auto scaling group, we have created an alarm and the CPU is going too high. What is go what's going to happen? It's going to trigger that alarm and that alarm is going to do two things. It's going to tell the auto scaling group, hey, our CPU is too high, you should immediately bring in a new server into the load and then this way we'll have a new resource to distribute that traffic to and handle that traffic. And at the same time, that alarm is going to send also a message to another service called Simple Notification System, SNS. And SNS, you're going to be able to create some distribution lists and say, hey, whenever this happens, I want those people to be informed. I want to send them either an email, I want to send them a text message, I want to send them a Slack notification, whatever you want, you can configure it. And depending on the time of day, etc., you can send to different people. Um, so you're going to be able to inform your team in live of what's going on in your infrastructure. Uh, and that's going to be true if your CPU is too high, but also if you know a service suddenly becomes unhealthy, or if your traffic is too low, or the WAF system has detected that you're under DDoS or whatever. You can use that mechanism of alarms and SNS to dispatch notifications to your team for any kind of event that happens on your infrastructure. So let's quick go back to our little schema we were seeing at the beginning. So top left corner, yeah, top left corner, we have our visitor. Uh, they're going to talk, in our case, to Harvard DNS. Uh, if it was AWS, that would probably root 53 DNS. Um, and the DNS is going to send the user to our WAF. The WAF is going to make sure that user is an actual user and not a bot or any kind of other malicious traffic. And if it's an actual user, it's going to be sent to our elastic load balancer. The elastic load balancer will dispatch the traffic between our multiple EC2 instances. And those EC2 instances are going to make cache and database queries to RDS and our memcache nodes. And if the user is also obvious, prob probably requesting some static assets, images, CSS files, JavaScript files, etc. those files are going to be requested to CloudFront. And if CloudFront doesn't have those files in cache, we're going to ask them to uh, S3. And we use CloudWatch top right, uh, middle right corner to keep an eye on all of this. And finally, if our, user, our developers are working, are pushing code to GitHub, that code is going to go through our continuous delivery system. And when it's ready, the continuous delivery system is going to push that code to code deploy, and code deploy will take the code and push it to our, C, um, our EC2 instances, making the code live. Uh, we now use this system to do what's called continuous delivery, and we went through from a process where whenever we needed to push code online, uh, a server guy and a developer would stay or you know connect at night, create a snapshot of the server, take the website down, upload, etc. everything, which was a very manual, long and painful process with downtime involved, to this continuous delivery system where basically we can do, we sometimes do two, three, four deployments a day uh, where we push new code and if there's any kind of problem uh, code deploy will also allow us to do a one-click rollback there's a problem we click one button 10 seconds later the website is back to the state it was like you know just before your deployment uh, so that also has been a great help for us and as you can see in the top right corner on top of this we use also another third-party service called Neuralic uh, to give us a, a more in-depth look at our application at WordPress itself because AWS obviously is not made for WordPress, it's made for you know any kind of application. So the monitoring tools that they're offering don't give us enough, uh, a, a deep enough look at what WordPress is doing. So for this, we use Neuralic to get that extra mile kind of information about WordPress. All right, again, I'm a developer and doing some infrastructure work, 
And as you can see, it's a lot of resources, a lot of things to manage, a lot of service to configure, you know, etc. For a longer time, I did that manually. And to be very honest, that was really stupid until I discovered that other service from AWS called CloudFormation. And CloudFormation is, has its limits, but it's pretty awesome. It basically allows you to create a JSON template of this. And once you've created that JSON template, one click and you can launch this entire stack in a matter of a few seconds. And the best part is, again, if you're working in a three-tier or four-tier environment, so when you have a dev staging prod environment, you usually want to have, you know, at least your staging and prod environment that are similar, equal to each other. So with that, one click and I can load my two services. And on top of that, if tomorrow I decide that I don't want to use Memcache, but I want to use Redis instead, I'm just going to make one change in my JSON template, push it to our code versioning system so we even know what's going on in our infrastructure. and. One, again, one click, it's going to update the stack and update my staging and production environment at the same time in a few seconds, which is pretty wonderful. So if you are looking into starting uh, using AWS for your hosting needs, I would definitely st suggest starting there. That should be really like the first thing you look at is CloudFormation. All right, uh, I think we still have a couple minutes for questions. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, there's a mic in the middle. Uh, you can download the slides for the presentation. And if you have some questions or you want to talk a little bit more, I'm also available via email and uh, Twitter, GitHub, all the good stuff. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions. All right, cool. Oh, one question, cool. outage uh, back in I think February happened we were actually not down uh, the website was still up uh, mostly because of our WAF solution that also does some caching for us uh, and had most of our web pages in cache uh, and it's static assets too so that kind of saved, saved us um, one so as I was mentioning you have the ability to uh, AWS offers multiple geographical regions. The good practice here and what would have potentially saved us is having our hosting environment duplicated into multiple regions. Okay, So you, you have two stacks on two regions. And this way, when the S3 outage happened on the East Coast, we would still have been up and running on, you know, for the rest of the globe. And you just shut down your East Coast uh, in uh, at the ELB level on, on our end, and we would have been fine. However, the problem with that is it means that you basically need to have two stacks, so double the resources to do that. And the budget impact for this, uh, we discussed it with our boss, and the you know <laughs> the decision was pretty clear uh, that was not a solution because that was just going to cost too much for half an hour of downtime once every five years. That was not worth it. Uh, what I would have done differently, uh, definitely use CloudFormation earlier on the process. Uh, maybe if I was to rebuild everything today, uh, I would look at different, probably a different stack, uh, Redis instead of Memcache, uh, maybe using containers um, instead of just the basic EC2 instance. Uh, by the way, AWS has a container service, fully compatible with Docker and stuff like that. 
Um, but yeah, um, not not much because this has been a very like evolving process, and I'm pretty happy where we are now. Uh, if you ha would have asked me the question six months ago, I would have probably had a very different answer. But we, yeah, well, I'm pretty happy where we are now. Now, as that said, AWS is launching three services a day, almost, and uh, there's always something cool, new, and shiny to play with. Uh, so, yeah, there's plenty to to do and and to yeah use. You want us? All right, cool. Thank you very much, and uh, have a nice Sunday.